It is always special for me to be here with you at the West Kentucky Lectureship. It holds a special place in my heart. It is somewhat of a homecoming for me, not that I grew up here at Sunny Slope, but I did grow up in West Kentucky just down the road. And because of that and because of the relationship which my family has had with the Wood family, it has truly held that special place for years and years and continues to do so. And it's such a joy for me to be able to be a part of these lectures, to be here each year with those who have taught me, those who have encouraged me and continue to do so, and I know those who love me and I love them. And I appreciate so much the opportunity to be here with you again. God knew the importance of a good friend. In fact, while Jesus was here upon the earth, what do we read? We read about the fact that He had friends. We read about how He chose His apostles, twelve of them, but there were three of them who were extremely close to Him. Peter, and James, and John. All a part of what we often call the inner circle there. Those who were true friends of our Lord. Those who got to be with Him in, in special times when other people did not get to be there with Him. Like when He was able to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, Mark 5, they were there. Like when... Jesus was transfigured, Matthew 17. They had the privilege of being there. Or when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, He took them. They had those special privileges because they were friends of our Lord. You know, friends can be such a blessing to us in... Good times and bad times, they comfort us in various ways. Proverbs 17 and verse 17, a friend loves at all times. You find out how we need those friends to give us advice at times, and they can help us out with hearty counsel. Proverbs 27 and verse 9, they build us up, they encourage us. The Proverbs writer again in chapter 27 and verse 17 tells us how iron sharpens Iron, so a man sharpens so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. They can be closer to you than your own family. Do you have friends like that? Again, Proverbs 18 and verse 24, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. See, so we're asking the question tonight: are our friends the most important thing? in the world? And I can answer that easily right off the bat, and the answer is no. Our friends are not the most important thing in the world, but I will say this, there is a friend that we want to have who is the more, most important friend that we can ever have, and that is our God. The Bible tells us plainly about how Abraham Abraham was a man who listened to our God. And James records it for us in, in chapter 2 and verse 21 where he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And then you read down in verse 23 how that Abraham was called the friend of God. I know how Jesus spoke with His disciples in John 15, verses 13 and 14, when He said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. We ask ourselves, how is it possible? How can we be friends How with a holy God, one who is up here and, and we're down here, but you realize, you realize how that God said, yes, here is where I am and here is where you are, but He gave us His only begotten Son. He gave us His Word. 
And he told us what we needed to do to move. Think about the importance of good friends. Those that we pour our hearts out to. Those that we can say anything to, we know that that we can say to them whatever it is that we're thinking, those that we want to be around, and, and we, we, we can ask them to do anything for us. We know that we can depend upon them at any time. We can be ourselves around them. Good friends. But now you take that further, and you take that to the relationship that we have as children of God. And that relationship is one where, yes, we can, we can say to God anything that's on our mind. In fact, He already knows. We pray to Him without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. David said, you pour your heart out to God, Psalm 62 and verse 8. And so we can ask Him anything just like we ask our friends. It's the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will... He hears us, 1 John 5, 14. There is a friendship that I read about in the Old Testament that is a great example for us tonight. It's the friendship that I want us to look at, one that, that is a beautiful relationship, one that we can learn from. It's one between David and Jonathan, the importance of great friends. I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18, and the first thing that I want us to see is this, that true friends walk with God. True friends walk with God. You look at this relationship that that these two individuals have, and, and what we're noting here in chapter 18 comes right after David is able to slay the giant Goliath, and he's praised for that. And, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now you look at this relationship, this friendship that they have. It's one where all of a sudden you find that Jonathan sees David, David sees him, and, and what is it? It's this immediate kinship that they feel toward one another. And the Bible says that Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. That is literally chained, the idea is, bound together in this inseparable union. Have you ever had a friend like that? Someone that you knew almost instantly, you you knew that, hey, we're going to get along. And you had this inseparable type of friendship. Someone said, and I think it's a very good description, friendship is a single soul dwelling in two bodies. It's a pretty good thought. A single soul dwelling in two bodies. Think about it. I, I've got a good friend of mine, we were together not too long ago, and we've known each other a little over a decade, and so we, we've been great friends throughout that time, and, and he was telling me something, and I was trying to, to think of uh, something that related to what he was saying, and all I got out was, what about, and he finished my sentence, <laughs> and I thought, how did you get that from what about? <laughs> Are we really that much in tune? You know, we must be. That's the type of friends that Jonathan and David were. It was that close of a friendship. And looking on the outside, they should not have been friends. Looking at it from 
a, a different standpoint as you go back and you learn about King Saul and how the Bible records for us, beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 10, how that King Saul started off very humble when he was chosen. You go down here in chapter 10 and verse 22 of 1 Samuel, and you find him, even though he's head and shoulders above all of the others, the Bible says that he has hid himself among the stuff. He was, he was so humble and, and one who, who couldn't believe that he's the one who's going to be king. But eventually what happens, his attitude changes. He becomes very prideful as he goes along. In chapter 13, we read about how he offers that sacrifice in violation to the law of God. How he's waiting for Samuel, but Samuel doesn't come exactly when he thinks that he ought to be there. And so he says, well, I, I forced myself and I made this offering. And because of that, Samuel has to tell him, you've done foolishly, verse 13. You've not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel but ever, forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. He says, The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You go down to chapter 15, and what you find out is, as Saul is one who is told to slay the Amalekites, to utterly destroy them. And as he goes to do so, he does not follow through exactly with the command of God. In fact, he saves King Agag alive, according to verse 8, and spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, of the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they utterly destroyed. Samuel has to deliver the news. The news is found in verse 26, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Who would be the king? David. As Samuel goes to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite, to find, to anoint the next king of the people of Israel, it is David, the, the one that nobody really thought about, the one who was ruddy, of a beautiful countenance, verse 12 says. The Lord said, Arise and anoint him. This is he. When Saul became depressed, and his servants told him, You need somebody to cheer you up. You need somebody to play on a harp for you. And I've heard somebody who can play, and it's David. David, the one who then did slay the giant Goliath. David, the one who did receive great praise from the people of Israel because of it. And now it's David, the one who is friends with the son of Saul, Jonathan, who is heir to his father's throne. But he honors David. You read here in 1 Samuel 18.4 that Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. He gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword, to his bow, to his girdle. And, and David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. It was an honor for David to receive these items, the royal insignia, the armor, the weapons here, where David's worth in the eyes of Jonathan was greater than his own. He's willing to give him his all, even the right to the throne. That's friendship. Why were they friends? They're both devoted to God. They're both walking with God. I want you to hear what Jonathan said back in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. 
As Jonathan is about to attack the Philistine garrison, the Bible tells us here that Jonathan says to the young man that bare his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, and it may be, listen to it, that the Lord will work for us. For there's no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Listen to the confidence in His voice and trusting in God, His loyalty, His sacrifice, His commitment, and listen to the very same by the words of David. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 37, David said, The Lord, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Two men who have a loyalty, a trust, a commitment to our God. Two men who are walking together. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3.3. James said, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4 and verse 4. We walk together. Paul said circumspectly, that is carefully, Ephesians 5.15. Watching our ways. Making sure that we are lining up with the ways that we have been taught, it's a continual walk. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot have friends who are not Christians. In fact, while Jesus was here, Matthew 9, 10 through 13, there were the Pharisees who were looking down upon Him because He was eating with publicans and sinners. And they were appalled that Jesus would do such a thing, that here is a righteous man and, and he is, is, is being so low that he's eating with unrighteous people. He's friends with them, Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. They were calling him a drunken man, a gluttonous man, a friend of publicans and sinners. But Jesus said this, healthy people, don't go to the doctor. But the sick people do. They needed Him. They needed Him just as every sin-sick soul needs Him today. Jesus' mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10, our mission is exactly the same. And we cannot do that if we are constantly withdrawing ourselves away from those who need the gospel the most. I know that it can be dangerous to have friends who are not Christians to the point where we allow them to influence us in a negative way. We do have to guard against that, but at the same time, we want to see them saved. When I go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, what I find there is the fact that there were some of the Corinthians whose hearts became divided to the point that they were becoming so close in their associations with non-Christians that what was happening was that their faith was starting to get weak. And so here's what the Apostle Paul said. Beginning in verse 17, Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Don't let those influences that are out there in the world cause you to get weak. Why? Because the promise is that we want to be cleansed from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The promise is God will adopt us as His own children, but what do we have to do? We've got to cleanse ourselves. 
realizing that it takes becoming more like him every day. We purify our souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, 1 Peter 1, 22. We love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, 1 John 2, 15. Keep ourselves clean. Asking ourselves, what am I concerned about the most? Am I concerned about the friends that, I'm, that I am associating with, that I have around me all of the time, and, and the words that they are saying, or what they are influencing me to watch, or influencing me to read, or the places they are influencing me to go? Good friends, true friends, walk together with God. Secondly, I want you to see that true friends are going to have problems. You're going to have problems. I guess sometimes we get the idea that because we are devoted to God, because we are Christians, then that means we're not going to suffer in any way, that we're not going to have any problems. And it's really quite the opposite. Second Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's going to be uh, things that happen from the outside in. And even Jesus experienced problems. Paul experienced a great deal of problems. Second Corinthians 11.24-28 through 28, when he, he details... How that five times he received 40 stripes, save one. He was beaten, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked. He, he suffered of his own brethren, he suffered of his own countrymen, and, and he was in peril in all of those situations. He was in fasting and nakedness and coldness. He was a child of God. Saul caused a problem. For David and Jonathan. In fact, 1 Samuel 18, verses 10 and 11. After the women are singing, they're playing, they're saying, Saul, he's, he's slain his... It's a familiar song, isn't it? Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands, and Saul was very wroth. The saying displeased him, and he said, They've ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they've ascribed but thousands. But what can he have more but the kingdom? And I want you to see the next phrase in 1 Samuel 18, 9. Saul eyed David. From that day and forward, insomuch that he tries to kill him, There was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin. He said, I will smite David even to the wall with it, verse 11. David avoided out of his presence twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. There was envy, there was jealousy in his heart. Saul even tried to turn his own son, Jonathan, against him. In chapter 19, we read how Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all of his servants that they should kill David. Jonathan spake good of David, verse 4, And to Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant against David, because he has not sinned against thee. And because his works have been to thee were very good. He did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? But over and over and over, we find how Saul hated the fact that Jonathan was so loyal to him. So loyal to David that he even tried to kill Jonathan, his own son. Chapter 20, verse 30 through 33. 
Have you ever had someone who was so jealous of your friendship with someone else? Because you are friends with, you were friends with this person, but now you're friends with this other person, and, and so now they feel slighted in some way, and there's jealousy or there's envy there. And maybe not even that, maybe just problems that have existed between you and a brother or sister in Christ who is a close friend, and that has separated you. Think about Philippians 4 and verse 3. Friends are going to have problems, even in the church. There was a situation there with two ladies. Paul beseeches them, the Bible says. Euodius and Syntyche were their names. And what he says is, brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown stand fast in the Lord. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, why? That they be of the same mind in the Lord. Something has happened here. There's some kind of problem, and this problem is brewing, and it, and it keeps growing, and it needs some type of solution here. Euodius, her name actually means something sweet. Syntyche means pleasant. These ladies were not acting sweet nor pleasant. A problem. A problem that, that needed a solution. And so Paul says, look at the positive things that have happened. We don't want this problem to grow and to divide the church in any way. You've seen that happen in churches before? So here is a problem that Paul says, look, you need to understand that, that you have labored with me in the gospel. You have struggled with me right alongside of me. And notice this also, your names are in the book of life. Knowing that their names were in the book of life, that should have been enough motivation to help them resolve those differences, this good friendship was in danger of being destroyed when we clash with each other or when someone from the outside starts meddling like Saul did with David and Jonathan. What are we going to do? I know sometimes personalities get in the way and sometimes we say, well, they did the wrong and they're the one, they need to come to me and they need to apologize for the wrong that they have done. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the one who thinks that he has been wronged has to go to his brother, Matthew 18 and, and verse 15. The one who is accused of doing wrong has to go to his brother, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. And so no one can say, I'm not at fault. They need to come to me. You need to go to each other. Run to each other. Because we don't want the world to see us as friends inside of the Lord's church fussing and fighting and not getting along. You think about the way that some of our brethren talk about each other. It's sad. It's sad the way that, the way that they feel sometimes and, and, and they say, I'm, I'm going to be in heaven with this person? And you can't get along here? We're going to have problems. True friends. True friends love each other. And I'll add to the end. When it came down to the death of Jonathan, we go to 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 26, and what we read here are the words of David. 
David says, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. They were not homosexual. But they had a deep, abiding friendship. One that was characterized by love. A love that said, I, I'm going to do anything for you. I, I'm not going to stop at, at anything. I, I'm going to do what's best for you no matter what, no matter what the consequences are. And you see that in the life of Jonathan and how, how yes, there was this determination to stand against the way that his father felt about David. And, and he wanted to know for sure they found out, 1 Samuel 20, 30-33, when he was trying to, to kill his own son. The New Testament tells me that though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I'm nothing. I am become a sounding brass, tinkling cymbal. Sounding brass. Picture a gong up here. Now, don't laugh, but when I was in high school, I would play the gong <laughs> from time to time. Played those cymbals as well. I know about the gong. I know about the cymbals. I knew that if I could hit that gong loud enough, people were going to notice. People were going to see. But then eventually that sound is going to go away. Paul says, If you don't have love, you're like that noisy gong. Yeah, you're going to call attention to yourselves. It's good at doing that, but, but you think about the fact that once it does that, it does nothing else, and it's worthless. John told us about the way we ought to love our brethren. 1 John 3 and verse 10 where he says, if you don't love your brother, you're not of God. He tells us there in verse 14, if we have this assurance that we've passed from death unto life, if what? We know that we've, we've done that. Why? Because we love our brethren. See, true friends are going to do that. Showing our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, realizing that Jesus said, hey, that's a mark of a true disciple John 13 and verse 35 what does that brotherly love and friendship look like it looks like Jonathan and David we can model ourselves after that we have to ask does it look like you and me there was a British publication that once offered a prize for the best definition of a friend. And among the thousands of answers received, I want to read to you just a few of them. Someone said, one who multiplies joys divides grief and whose honesty is inviolable. One who understands our silence a watch that beats true for all time and never runs down. But here's the winning definition. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. Are we friends like that? Like our Lord.